your guns, Damon. I ain't going back. They told me. Son, you're special. You were born to do great things. You know what? They were right. sense? Just tell me, just say yes. <laughs> hey. Wow. What a crowd, jeez. And everybody's so peaceful too. Where my hotel is, is near the uh, ballpark and football fans, not peaceful. Let me tell you, hooligans. You know, whenever somebody robs a bank, they never say in the newspaper, you know, like, oh, oh my God, and guess what? He plays football, too, you know? You never get blamed for that. Uh, thanks for coming to our panel today. Um, you know, PC Gamer, we talk technology and all the time. We talk about uh, graphics and games all the time, and it's important because it's an important part of the PC experience. Um, you know, graphics, we can choose our settings, we get to, to decide how much we want to invest in our hardware. So that's important, but it's not everything. And no matter how much we invest in our hardware, the images you see on the screen are never going to be as rich and as evocative as the ones you see, you know, in your imagination. And uh, so how many people in this room have been gaming for more than 10 years? Whoa! Oh. Holy moly. How about, okay, no, keep your hands up. How many have been gaming for more than 20 years? Keep it up. Ugh. Well, I've been gaming more than 30, okay? And when I started, they didn't have graphics. It was nasty. On my Apple II hand crank, you know? It was text and you loved it, you know? But I remember those stories. They were fantastic. And, uh, and graphics have come a long way since then. Well, number one, we have them. So that's nice. Uh, but I remember those stories. I remember Ultima. I remember the Infocom games. And uh, even though graphics have come a long way, storytelling has come a very, very long way as well. And I feel like we're not talking about that enough. Uh, the way we experience games, the way we play them, the way we share them has all changed. And I want to talk about that some more. Uh, because the more we talk about it, the more we understand it, and the more we understand storytelling in games, the more we appreciate it, and the more we appreciate it, we expect better things. And when we expect better things, we're pushing forward what is basically an unlimited gaming platform. So who best to talk about uh, the future of storytelling? This is what we called it, the incredible uncertain future of storytelling, because it's being created right now, today, by our fantastic guests who've joined us today. So without any more ado, I want to introduce uh, executive editor Evan Lottie, who's going to introduce our panelists today. Thank you so much. All right. This room is saturated. Great. Um, yeah, I'm Evan from PC Gamer. How's it going? And I'm delighted to introduce what I'd like to call a Voltron of panelists, uh, a Justice League, if you will. So, right here, or right there. Yes. Um, joining us today is Sean Vanman, creative lead on The Walking Dead. Uh, we've also got Greg Sabin, creative director from Supergiant Games. <laughs> Jake Solomon, lead designer on XCOM Enemy Unknown. Uh, 
And the man you know as Notch, the creator of Minecraft. And finally, it is his first PAX, all the way over from the Czech Republic via the New Zealand, of course, Dean, Ro Dean Rocket Hall. <laughs> that guy. All right, I'm, de I'm delighted to be sitting down with you guys today. Thanks so much for coming. So we want to kick off this kind of casual conversation about storytelling games and the future of storytelling just by asking you guys if you consider yourselves to be storytellers at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm done. laughs> go ahead. Yes, I mean, you know, I think probably we all do things very differently. Um, and I think that's why this is a really interesting panel. Like, when you talked to me about it, I thought that was, like, sort of world builders, like, you were building systems versus, like, systems and then story on top of those. Like, I think hopefully this is a good conversation. But uh, me personally, yes, because that's sort of the mission of the company I work for, which is, hey, I have one of my own. Hey, that's <laughs> fun. <laughs> but uh, awesome. is story. Like, if the story isn't resonating in a Telltale game, then we have a, like a really steep hill to climb, so yes. Specifically to me, though. What about yourself, Jake? Um, let's see, Notch said no, Sean said yes. Sort of, I guess, yeah. Or I should go with Notch, he's always right. So, so I'm gonna go, no, um, what Notch said. That's gonna be my answer for everything. Um, no, I, I would say sort of, because at Firaxis we talk about internal narrative and external narrative, and external narrative being the the narrative that we tell the players, but for us the most powerful experience is the internal narrative that the players create based on their own actions and their own stories. So we, we're kind of the storytellers, but you know the way we think about it is that we're, we're also the set builders, and so it's our job to build a set, give the player the best props that we can, and then let them tell the story. Is this thing on? Yes. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, my, my response is similar, actually. I, I, Am I a storyteller? Uh, I, I created a character who's a storyteller, uh, who's the narrator in Bastion, but uh, the, the experience of it should still really be the, the, the players, and for us, the, the gameplay really comes first, and the, the story exists uh, in service of the play experience. So our goal is, is to make games, um, and, and the story is just a part, part of what should make that experience uh, appealing. So um, I don't think I think of myself as a storyteller first. Should I expand on my no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. I think yeah, it's uh, more enigmatic if you don't, if you just say no. One word yeah. answers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, uh, stories a game is, is very interesting because you can either set out to tell a story or either just set out to like uh, provide the tools to play around. And. Uh, Games is a form of entertainment that can be a, a linear thing like a movie or it can be uh, just a playground to play around in. And I'm mostly interested in just making a world that has some kind of coherent rules to it where you can have fun. And in Minecraft, it kind of happened to become very uh, story emergent, like people got their own stories to tell. But that's probably because uh, Minecraft is very inspired by roguelikes, which also have like, people will write huge stories on what happened in the uh, uh, Dwarf Fortress, for example, people will read those. And uh, uh, I don't think uh, Toad is a storyteller necessarily, but he's a storyteller enabler. Yeah, I, I sat down with the uh, um, CCP guys at Gamescom, and uh, we'd kind of come to the conclusion, particularly I did, that uh, um, we weren't very good at entertainment uh, at all. So in terms of stories, uh, yeah, um, it, was, it was like you're saying, you know, we, we set up the environment for, for people to have those. And I think rather than telling a story, what, what I was looking for with Daisy was setting up situations where people could explore and experience emotions and experience, uh, yeah, things that they wouldn't otherwise, I guess, be able to experience in the world. And I think that's something that, that I got from Minecraft when I first played it, you know, go, being able to do things and particularly do things together. I guess that's why I like multiplayer because I think now more than ever before you can have these amazing experiences 
not just with the people you're playing with, but you can actually share them through Twitch, you can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, so now more than ever, you can actually do that. I'm glad you brought up emotion. Um, I'm curious for each of you, what emotion is kind of the most difficult to instill in players? I gotta be first on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, You're the storyteller, man. You go ahead. You know, I mean... I mean, I mean Walking Dead is, is known right now for, for being a very challenging game emotionally. And you know, in terms of development, what's what's been especially tough for you guys like to, to trigger a certain response that you're going for? Yeah, I mean, I can answer that for sure. Um, you know, it's not so much here as we want people to be sad, we want people to laugh. Like that part, that's part of the job um, for the type of game we're making. So that's not really the challenge. Um, actually, I was talking with uh, Jake Rockin, who's a co-lead on the game, about this this week, and he kind of re brought up a point that we were talking about throughout development, which is so much about game, like what we were going trying to accomplish with The Walking Dead at Telltale. Like what could we do with the tools that we had and the license that we had and the sort of opportunity we were given. And we like a lot of games where we, like personally, when we're at home playing, where we're kind of poking systems and seeing what happens and watching the emotions kind of come out of the screen because of the event that's um, happening. But so much of those emotions, especially in the experiences that um, uh, Marcus and Dean are talking about, are internal. So we wanted to make a game where we're creating scenarios, right, and sort of story events that can butt up against each other that's sort of poking you like you're not poking the system so much, the game is poking you and seeing how you feel about meaning and sort of when you put you know, scene A versus scene, scene B, but the player makes scene C happen, what is the meaning that happens inside of you and that being different? Those scenarios, what are the scenarios that are gonna poke the most are the hardest for The Walking Dead, but mm -hmm. those are the things we've really put the most time into. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from in, in my experience, making the player feel emotion at all is, is a real challenge. I mean, I think what you, what you don't want is, is to, you know, people can engage with systems on a superficial level or they can experience a story and, you know, anything can pull the player out of that, whether it's a frustration with the mechanics or, or anything. And so, I mean, I, I think that when a player experiences emotions like, I'm speaking as a player now, like those are my strongest, those are, to me, those are my best memories of games, you know, so whether something goes terribly wrong and in a game like XCOM or, or Daisy, like I get, I get strong emotions watching the YouTube videos of DayZ. And I, I mean, like, like we at our studio, we like IM each other, trying to one-up each other with videos from DayZ. And you will watch them, and you're just like riveted. So um, I got anxious with like the 10-second clip that was in that trailer. Right. Like, oh my god, he's bleeding. Oh, you got to run away. You're going to be out of blood in like two minutes. You got to go. You got to go. It really stressed me out. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think making players feel emotion at, at all is 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 challenging. But um, yeah, I think that um, in, in general, just uh, making that happen is is, is probably the challenge. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly um, agree with that as well. It's like you you're trying to get the player to feel something other than you know frustration with the controls or like <laughs> frustration is the <laughs> easiest thing as yeah, a designer to make the player feel that comes naturally disgust and frustration yeah confusion yeah. confusion also very easy to achieve uh, <laughs> right. if only games. there was an audience for that um, i would be yeah, i would be a millionaire but, right um, now yeah getting getting past those things the frustration and confusion and so forth and get, getting people to actually you know experience something more positive um, like in in, in the case of Bastion, we wanted, we hope that people could feel some sort of a sense of wonder at like what's going on. What's going on, what's this world all about, what is all this stuff, in a positive way as opposed to in a way that was like, I'm just confused and don't know what's happening. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, but there isn't any, you know, anything like uh, making the player actually genuine, genuinely feel scared, I think is extremely difficult in a game, because it's a game you can, respawn if you die or whatever in most games. Some games solve that. Um, uh, all, all those things uh, are, seem extraordinarily difficult in their own right, and we, we didn't really go for any one particular emotion in our case, just tried to achieve that like kind of uh, immersive atmospheric quality, um, which has a bunch of different factors, I guess. Yeah, um, I don't know which uh, emotion is the most difficult but uh, I think a lot about that and like how 
because I think a lot about the game mechanics about the game, not necessarily the story or the setting. And uh, it's very interesting how different mechanics can really evoke different uh, feelings. I think it's uh, my theory is that the, the stuff you actually force the player to do is what leads to emotions. Kind of in amnesia, you have to actually hold down the button and pull back to open a door. It's not just clicking, go, uh, but you actually have to open the door yourself, and that makes it a lot scarier. And um, like in Proteus, I get a true sense of wonder, and like uh, it looks like it's a beautiful place, and it has very bad graphics. Can I say that? <laughs> uh, yes. But it still, it has, a, it has a like true feeling of wonder, which is interesting. And I don't, I don't know what about the game mechanics in it that does that. If it's the graphics or if it's the mechanics. So I don't know which feeling is the most difficult. I think they all are probably, except frustration, like trying to install some game. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh. Wow. Oh shit! Oh my goodness! They just that was put like that six out there. Of the first that's, a, that's thanks a lot. That's a nice segue into my my segment. <laughs> so I think I think we can start by agreeing that, that we've got that uh, difficult to use and confusing controls things nailed. Like, uh, we've got that one right down. So um, I think uh, in terms of from my thinking, the dealing with the emotions was about getting the game out of the game and into the player's head. So if you actually look at, like Daisy, a lot of the aspects of it are really simple, maybe even fundamentally broken, uh, but the game goes on inside the player's head because they're in a persistent world, because they, uh, they know that their player uh, will be there when they log back on. Uh, it means that they, it's like something switches over in their head. And, and I kind of experienced a similar thing with Minecraft, with my friends, and we were like building things together. and you start to get that real sense that what you're doing matters. And I think that context is important to getting an emotional context to the game. If what you're doing doesn't feel like it matters to you, then you don't get scared because you're like, whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of people who play DayZ who maybe they don't have that context and they can just run around and, want, and do what they want. But the people who are feeling like connected with their character, those are the people who get those emotional responses. And I think if you're going to provide emotional responses in a game, you can't focus on only the good or the desirable emotions. You have to prepare for frustration, for anger, you know, the kind of where the person will quit the game, maybe even uninstall it. Uh, it's kind of like with a film, you know, you, you, have to, you have to look at the whole spectrum of emotions that, that a player can have and not be frightened to deal with them all. And actually, real quick, the one thing I would, because listen to him, I mean, he's very right. I think one of the easiest ways to create emotion in players, which we've seen in, in XCOM and you certainly see in, in games like DayZ, is, is consequence. Um, you know, when, when there are actual consequences for the player's actions, then they feel like they have ownership over the story, and, and that really creates strong emotions. And so I think that that's a, that's a major... Again, saying that choices matter, I, I do think that that's a major element to creating real emotion in players. Cool. Yeah, because I, I saw your doppelganger in your video talking about risk-reward in XCOM, and I think right. that was a very relevant part of it as well, if there's that risk-reward, which I think people naturally, you know, they naturally understand that, uh, you know, that whole basis of risk-reward right. is kind of like an intuitive thing, so yeah. people dial into it. Yeah, if I've learned anything from gambling, it's that humans have a tendency to turn games of chance into games of skill yeah. as well. It's sort of impressed that upon that mechanic. Um, and by the way, we don't have to answer in a linear fashion. We don't have to have like a li ahead. linear storyline, so to speak. We can get a little open world with our conversation. Um, Actually, if I can, um, I have a quick yeah. question. So in The Walking Dead, in Bastion and XCOM, Enemy Unknown, you, know, you kind of know when a story twist is, what kind of effect it has, because does the person go, you know, ah, like that. And so you know instantly, you've got that feedback. But in Minecraft and in DayZ, when you've made a change or alteration or added something in a game, what are your metrics for like knowing, how do you uh, ascertain whether or not it's successful? I kind of want to know what Notch's answer to this is because I think, <laughs> I think with DayZ, uh, for better or for worse, I pretty much just pushed play and saw what happened uh, and, then, and then just gingerly watched the forums and, and things like that. I, I, I guess <laughs> with, with DayZ, I was, I was trying to build that emotional context. So it was a matter of deciding what I felt was right and then I would check it with a few friends and talk about it, see what other people were saying and then just try it. Like, 
I, I don't think there was another way to do it. You could get a, you get a, get a whole group of experts and them all agree that one way is a really good way to go uh, and then try it out and it was a disaster. So yeah, I, I think the, the answer was just being creative and not being frightened to break things. That was sort of from my perspective. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. So <laughs> <laughs> nailed it. It's a, there are too many components in a game like Minecraft to test them all and try to figure out some kind of top-down design on the, the game. The game kind of emerges from the, the components. It's very, you can't predict it. Yeah, and I think uh, that kind of approach was definitely what we're taking with the standalone was to look at it and say, rather than designing these discrete problems, like when I was working on console games, we'd always look at it and say, okay, this is the experience we want the player to have. We want them to do this, this, this. They have this, this options, and these can be the outcomes, and they're all balanced. And instead, with, with Daisy, we just go, okay, well, this is the problem we've created, and then someone will say, well, how do you solve it? And we're like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Like, maybe it's not solvable, but yeah. And I think that, that makes, that, that sort of brings the players into the design then, because mm -hmm. they're actually trying to figure this out. And I had the same things with Minecraft when I played it. You know, you, you're, you're problem solving, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you guys see as a, a trend in game storytelling today that you're fond of, and maybe one that you're not fond of? Well, I, I'm not <laughs> fond of excitement. Like, I think excitement's kind of been done. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> excitement's overrated. Well, I mean, that, that sort of begs I mean, the question. I mean, like, games traditionally in some way, like player appeasement is part of games. And Daisy has kind of a unique answer for appeasement. I mean, there's no instruction in Daisy. I mean, unless you've watched some YouTube videos, a friend has walked you, know, walk you through the game, um, you're kind of on your own to figure it out. And, and that, that feeling of like, you know, problem solving and discovery in this incredibly harsh environment, I sort of see that as an answer to the trope of like over tutorializing, you know what I mean? Yeah, I hope Microsoft's watching this. We, we don't want tutorials and TRCs. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, for the rest yeah. of you guys, I mean, what's, again, what's a trend? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, to that point, uh, it, it's not necessarily just about storytelling, but I think there is a response not just to, like, kind of over-tutorializing, but also just sort of, just the general dumbing down in terms of difficulty, in terms of uh, design that you're seeing these games, everything from Dota 2 to Dark Souls, Demon Souls to Daisy, these games that gain, like, a huge and passionate audience, and they're super hard, and they're, they're kind of initially opaque. You have to kind of struggle to learn them and get good at them. But the reward, you know, is, propor is proportional to that effort. And I hope that audience is still there in October. Oh, well, yeah. 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 No, that I would think, be nice. Yeah, yeah we'll, I'll be there. Um, it's, it's just, you know, some people, it, it's part of what makes games appealing is it's this self-contained world that you can learn and discover the rules of it and everything. And when it's, when it's too simple, it's not as interesting. Uh, in all cases. Yeah, and something that kind of frustrates me is uh, uh, I don't mind linear games. I like uh, picking up a shooter and just playing through it. And I also like open-ended games. But when someone high up in a company says, oh, it can't be a linear game, so we'll have three dif different endings that you select in the last two minutes, uh, it kind of ruins the immersion to me. It's like you're pretending like you have choice, but you're, you knew when you were playing the game that you had no choice in the game. The story was going to happen, and you can choose whether or not the good guy dies or lives. Uh, and that really annoys me because it breaks the immersion of the linear story. Does that make any sense? No, it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think. Well, I think like morality in games is sort of not really we explored at all. I mean, it's kind of really like on face value, which I think is a problem. And uh, you know, we got kind of lucky with The Walking Dead. It's a the, the source material that the game is based on is so it is it it's about making that outdated and saying, okay, put that aside, now this is just a world about the breaking point of somebody's individual humanity, and to do that, you have to make a character and to, so you can break them, you know, or figure out what their, their line is. So, you know, the, some of the heavy lifting was done for us, but, you know, I think alongside with sort of like good, bad being a trope for choice, which I think isn't so much like on it, like that's not bad. And it's, I don't mean to say that like you shouldn't do that if that's what your game is about, but you're closing off a lot of doors for interesting gameplay 
uh, and making the job a lot harder for yourself, I think, when you sort of have this meter on the left of the screen that's like, oh, I'm getting worse, oh, I'm getting better, oh, I'm getting horns on my head, and like, not, you know, like, you know, like, and that's really fun, right? Like, that's sort of like, you're playing this toy that's like, oh, I wonder how bad I can make my guy, and I wonder how good I can make my guy, and like, there, that's cool, but like, for a narrative, I don't find it as interesting, personally. So, there's that, and then, not to go on too long on one question, but I do think, like the thing that all the games up here have in common, and I haven't played yours yet, but I will today, I promise, <laughs> um, is that you're experiencing, whether it's mechanics or events, that make you feel like a human being, like a person. Like, it was important for us when making Lee in The Walking Dead. He doesn't run super fast. He's not a badass. He falls a lot in the first episode, like <laughs> probably one time too many. <laughs> um, but uh, that was really important because we had this character who has his own emotional baggage, but we're trying to have, we want people to have empathy for the character. We want our characters to be capable of empathy. And then we want pe like, this sort of like that, the idea of empathy in games and sort of considering that really allows you to tell, if you say that's what you're gonna do, you have a broad swath of stories that then open up to you and challenges to overcome that are different than if you aren't thinking about that from the beginning. And I think like, that's where I would like to see games go. Um, so I didn't answer the positive part no. of that question. But, no, I mean, like, yeah. I like that you're touching on the value of sort of experiences that are not explicitly epic. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of a thread between, I mean, I guess in all three of your guys' games, you, you I'm sorry, between DayZ, Minecraft, and Walking Dead, you can sort of feed other people or you can cook food in this really, really kind of mundane way, but it's, again, you feel human through that. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really good point. Like, um, I, a lot of games maybe go for that super superhero orientation because people really like superheroes and everyone wants to be a superhero. But it's kind of like in their brain they know that, that not everybody can be a superhero. And if everyone's a superhero, then that means that there's nothing really super about it or maybe even not really hero. So you need that context and, and that's why in like, you know, Daisy, Minecraft and, and may, you know, The Walking Dead as well, like the world, uh, you don't matter to the world. You know, you're not important, the world carries on if you're not there, and I think people understand that because that's real life, yeah. Wow, that's harsh. Real life, where you don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that's another really good quote there. there. there you can, that's for when you guys go stand alone, just right there. Put that right there. <laughs> There's your box quote. <laughs> you, you, so, I'm sorry. No, sorry, sorry. So, we're, you know, we're sort of touching on this notion of tropes in, in game storytelling. I think there's plenty of them. There's plenty of them to talk about. Um, so Greg, Bastion had kind of an interesting approach to addressing a really classic trope, uh, the, the silent protagonist, mm -hmm. where, I mean, there, there's some value certainly, and, and you feel free to agree or disagree with me, in a silent protagonist in that it's, it's easy for a player to project themselves into that character. Yep. I mean, humans are really good at projecting. You know, when I'm driving a car, I don't say, you know, if somebody hits me, they hit me. They didn't hit my car. Right. Um, that's, that's just kind of like the natural way we think of things, I think. Um, anyway, back to Bastion. <laughs> um, so Bastion had a narrator, but it sort of retained that opportunity for players to be empathetic with the character and impress themselves. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, what, other, what are some other tropes and cliches that need solving? Yeah, well, we, um, we played a lot with those kind of uh, conventions, because mm -hmm. um, in some ways, the game is, you know, it, we, we looked at it partly as kind of an homage to a lot of the games we grew up playing, um, uh, just a, a kind of a classic uh, action adventure games and stuff like that. So everything from like the kind of post-apocalyptic setting, the save the world story, like on the surface, Bastion has all these kind of cliches going for it, the silent protagonist, and we try to take all those things and then do, then just kind of twist them um, in, in some sort of, um, in, in, in just a way that we hadn't seen before um, that, that was interesting to us. Because, um, you know, cliches and tropes, they exist for a reason, right? They're, they're, they're compelling to people in some core way. And, and the cliche occurs when there's nothing there beneath the surface. When you kind of find a way to deepen it and make it specific, um, then it takes on kind of a particular character and can take on some kind of meaning for someone. So that was kind of how we approached it. Um, uh, even, you know, um, yeah, every, every aspect of the story that we, uh, Amir, our, our co-founder, and I, we, uh, I, I did the writing, and he was my editor, so we were talking about the story all the time, and we, like, we would all the time joke about, like, these save-the-world stories and how terrible they are, because no one 
here or anywhere has the experience of what it's like to save the world. That's not something that anyone can relate to. Um, why don't games try to tell stories that people can actually identify with? So yeah, we tried to like take that kind of story because it's, uh, you know, you understand it on the surface in games and try to make it more uh, resonant and more relatable to people in our case. But yeah, it kind of takes a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, iteration, if nothing else, is just uh, trying different stuff and seeing how it works on, on people. Yeah, for the rest of you guys, just to reiterate, are there any tropes that you'd identify that like, you'd like to blast off the earth with a laser or something? Well, I think yeah. uh, uh, tropes and cliches are really useful game design tools. Yeah. Because uh, they imply things to the user and they're used to mm -hmm. those things. You have to be very careful so you don't just make uh, a Zynga game. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you, if you know that the, the language of games, you can really use those things, especially for the, the, the game components that aren't necessarily the standout features. But like, if there's a door, you expect to be able to open it. Then actually, in games, you can't expect not to be able to open them. But uh, I think it's... Uh, yeah, there's a reason everything in Minecraft, I mean, there's zombies and skeletons and it's very, like, cliche stuff, but it's because it's very easy to communicate through those. And, yeah, that, that is something that, at Firaxis, we talk about all the time, whether it's XCOM or whether it's Civilization. We talk about, or even pirates, like, we talk about co-opting the user's backstory because we want to make, so XCOM, sure, it's an alien invasion. That's not a bad thing because we're not a very strong narrative game. And so for us, we don't have to do a lot of exposition. We can just say alien invasion. And then we actually play to that and say, look, you know, sectoids play to that. Um, when we made a new alien, the thin man, the UFOs are discs. Because again, there is, the player comes in with a lot of story in their head. And if you can co-opt that and use that, then that's really useful when your story, when your game isn't, isn't that narrative. So. Something like civilization, when you're given the choice of do you want to research gunpowder, do you want to research the wheel, that actually has a lot of emotional resonance with people because that comes out of their head, that comes out of their emotion, you know, their backstory. So th those are things that we talk about all the time at Frax about co-opting backstory. Like we don't, we don't do much backstory, so we need to use whatever's in the player's head. And so we do use some of those, those tropes. Great. So, uh, we talked a little bit about choice today, and choice has kind of been a big buzzword ever since Mass Effect, Dragon Age, those games really emerged and set the template for branching narratives. And I'm curious how you guys would rate, sort of, <clears throat> throughout the gaming industry, the quality of choices we're presented with today, and sort of also think ahead to what we can do to build on the concept of the branching narrative, what, what that's going to look like in the next generation. Hmm. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I love those games, and, but I think for me as, as a developer, I'm interested not even in branching narrative, but just completely open narrative. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to, to allow, again, to have the player to sort of drive that story. And so, um, you know, branching narrative is, you know, that's, that's something beyond, I wouldn't even know how to talk about that really. It's not really our type of game, but I, I think that what's most exciting for me is, is the sort of emergent narrative that happens in, in things like, you know, survival and Minecraft or, or Daisy. I mean, I think that I'm really interested in, in strategy games too, which obviously, again, we're not huge narrative, but it is lots of choice that matters. And I think that civilization, XCOM, you know, people end up creating these fashioning these stories that are, in, in their own way, they're branching narratives. They just have a lot, a lot of branches. And so, for me, that's what I'm really excited about, it, is sort of when we talk about choice, um, opening it up even more. I mean, if you think of Skyrim or Red Dead Redemption, like a lot of times, you know, I won't even beat the game. I'll spend all my time, like, out in the world where all the emergent shit happens. And I just, and that to me is like the story of my character. So for me, that's, that's probably the most exciting stuff in the future. I, I guess for me, I, I'd like to see more, uh, less making narratives and stories and more making worlds. Like, and I think when I first played Minecraft, that's when I started to get 
that feeling like, hey, there is actually this world here and me and my friends can, can go around and we can, we can experience and, and change that world. And, and DAISY was a small experiment to see if that could be done in sort of a non-stylized environment. So I don't even really think about narrative. I think I'm really bad at it. I also think I'm really bad at story, um, among other things, like install instructions. Thanks, 4chan. <laughs> and, and, uh, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been able to show the BBC how to install it. But um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think it's for, from my perspective, and I accept I'm a bit of a freak in terms of video games, but, you know, I like to see it more about just creating the world and then letting the players um, fully develop and experience the narrative, you know, beyond, beyond anything before. And I think that kind of frees you as a designer because it means that you're just looking at, at, yeah, filling the world with its function and letting the players fill the content. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard for me, like, I can't really rate any of that stuff right now. It's like, we were dead in the middle of, a, like, an episodic season that is linear narrative, uh, story choices, dialogue choices, like, your choices matter. Like, that's sort of, like, the message. It's like, you know, if you walk into the expo hall and talk to anybody at the booth, that's what they're going to tell you about The Walking Dead, you know. And, but I think games have this really, and it's an opportunity that we're starting, to, like, that we're taking advantage of in The Walking Dead, but I'm really excited for the future, um, especially at Telltale, the stuff that I'm able to work on there, because we kind of realized that there was a couple of really interesting things we could do with sort of story events. That is, if we make them idiosyncratic and personal and let people empathize with them and get a hold of them, they can personalize those things and then let them make choices about what story events are going to butt up against those. They're producing meaning that is their own. And the game, our responsibility, I think, is as designers is to pay attention to those, sort of try to understand their meaning and keep saying yes to the player. I think there's definitely a market for really story-driven games with like very specific narratives um, with complex characters out there. If the game is saying yes to player action and not no, you did that, you died, or like no, you did that, that's the wrong thing. You know, like whenever people are working on The Walking Dead and sort of somebody comes in and says, oh, I have this idea, and then, you know, you make this choice, but then if you do that, like, so-and-so is really pissed at you, and they come over and they say this thing. You know, I'm like, they can be pissed at you as a character, but they cannot say that to you, because you're going to make you feel like you played the game wrong. So I think games, unlike any other thing, have this opportunity to say yes all the time, and I think that's what we need to, like, to latch on to, if we're going to be telling specific stories, as opposed to um, building worlds with really intricate systems. And I love those games for what it's worth. I just think there's, there's not one path, you know. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel much the same way where really with, with Bastion, it's like we, we have some choices in there that I guess you could call moral choices, but we never would have hung our hat on, on something like that. In fact, we tried to kind of surprise people with that and introduce that in a way where it's not like, hey, this whole game you're making important choices because I, I think that's, that's kind of a, it's tough to convince people that you know, your choices are really gonna matter in this game, because a lot of games uh, try to tell you that, and you can, sometimes you can see through it, as, um, as has been mentioned before. Um, but then, the thing of like, responding to how the player plays for the game, you know, that's, that's almost like the game empathizing with the player, supporting their play style, and responding to that play style. So even if you have a linear, a largely linear story like Bastion's, there are little parts along the way where you can um, where it's just kind of responding to the particular small choices that you make where maybe you didn't even realize you were making a choice. It's something about your play style or something like that. That's a, sorry, just um, to interrupt. The first time yeah. I ran through all those guys in the first level, I think it was at PAX maybe, I was running through and after the first big fight, he's like, he just keeps on running. And I was yeah, like, yeah. fuck, this game was awesome. But like <laughs> yeah. I really, that was like my favorite moment. No. Like, and now you had me as a customer from like the moment that happened. So yeah, sorry yeah, to interrupt. No, and that, and that stuff was super fun during develop. I mean, that, that, that's when we knew we were onto something because we'd get reactions like that. And we, we, you know, sometimes we can anticipate some of these things and, and other times um, we just watch people play and we write that stuff in based on what we see people doing. So in our case, it actually helps that um, our systems are, are, are more constrained. You know, the game isn't as, as open-ended, as, as obviously not nearly as open-ended as something like a Minecraft. So when your tools within the game are somewhat more limited, um, we, can, we can then, you know, try to find that balance of like creating a lot of content to support how people do play it within this, within this rule set that, that we've made. And that's, and that's really fun. And then hopefully they feel like there's the, the story that we tell is more personal to them and, 
they're not just like a spectator, um, you know, getting rewarded with, with cutscenes or something like that every time they beat a level. Yeah, and I just want to uh, recommend a game that's related to this and that brings up a few interesting points about uh, games in general. It's the Stanley Parable. Do play that. Yeah. yeah. That's a terrific mod for Half-Life 2. Yeah. Great. Kind of a short story structure. Yeah, really interesting. Great. Uh, so finally, I think I want to end, perhaps, by asking you guys, what are some things, maybe technically or otherwise, preventing games from telling better stories? I think the player himself. Sure. The, the, sure. Yeah, the game developers <laughs> try to figure out the, the, the structure of the game and try to uh, follow the rules of the game or try to break the rules. Uh, I love The Walking Dead, it's very good, but when I have to choose which character I have to save, it's slightly like uh, emotional, but it's also, oh, which gameplay am I going to miss if I say one and don't say the other? So I think the player uh, is the biggest problem. You have to make them forget to playing a game, which is why it's easy on multiplayer, because then you're actually playing other ple people. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had, you know, I, I heard some, somebody was talking about having more mature themes in games, which I don't think anybody disagrees with, but I, I remember thinking that the problem, and, and this could affect storytelling, is that there aren't great game mechanics that map to things like love and relationships and romance, things that are very powerful in our lives. Um, it's really hard to design mechanics that can match the satisfaction or the frustration or the, the risk-reward of things like romance and, and love and sex. And Well, maybe sex wouldn't be that hard, but <laughs> I'd be willing to try. I am but, uh, so playing your game right. after this. I'm walking straight over there. There's no sex in it. We would sell more. There's sex in XCOM. Um, there's <laughs> lots of sex in XCOM. Um, that's down. what the X stands for. Right. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that we haven't developed. We've developed great mechanics for shooting and killing, but we haven't developed great mechanics for... And, and I don't know that they can be for the, the more subtle things that are very affecting emotionally. And I, and I would be very, I'm very interested to see somebody tackle that because I think that would be a, a major step forward. Without being like too doom and gloom or anything, um, I think there's a couple things for like, especially mass market games, like the two things that I think are holding story back a little bit are kind of just the industry inertia, like things are big and spectacular and expensive and you know, like, you make what people have bought already, sort of thing, you know? So like, especially on the, on the large scale, you know, at, at Telltale we've kind of figured out that like our competitive advantage, if I can use like a business word, is like just make something really small and personal and see what happens, you know? So I think that's one thing. And also like, especially, and I mean, it's our, it's, there's like, we have like six outliers up here, or five, how many other of us? But, um, you know, Big games, it's so, like, I think I was, you were talking about Red Dead, and I, I really like Red Dead, and sort of, it's weird, right? The systems are out there in the world, and you're just running around, you're like, oh my god, I'm in the Old West, this is the best. Right. And then you go to town, and you go on a linear mission, it's a linear story, and they don't really talk to each other ever. Right. But, like, multi-hundreds of people make that game, and the script is so big, and you're doing, you know, I think, God, it's just like, it's trying to run a marathon with like, you know, like an anchor attached to your leg when you're just hauling this huge experience behind you with this giant team. Like, I don't know how people do it, you know? So I think that's something that if you're setting out to tell a story, maybe try not doing that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and Dean, I'd like to ask you spe specifically, I mean, what's, what's standing in your, in your way of, of making Daisy a better story generator? Uh, well, I think, um, I think probably a lot of that is is really just improving the base game, like, and uh, I think that we achieved what we wanted with Daisy in terms of it. At the start, a lot of people were complaining about a lot of things in terms of they were they had all these expectations of games. They were like, well, what do I do? And uh, you know, well, why doesn't the game tell me to do this? Or why doesn't the game tell me to do that? So I kind of feel like we've won that part of the game. And uh, now people are doing things with Daisy that I never could have imagined, and maybe I didn't want to imagine. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's really good, and and so I I kind of think like that's why the the Daisy mod has been has has done what it needed to in that respect, because gamers have said, yeah, you know, we'll we'll deal with um, impossible to install, we'll deal with uh, controls that are designed by some like 
you know, masochistic person, and, 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 and I'm going to get in trouble for that when I go back to the Czech Republic. I'll probably get stopped at the border or something. But, um, <laughs> but so, you know, like, we're, all those things, but if they can generate these stories and do these interesting things, it's like uh, you just sort of let people loose and, and they run into it. So I think, uh, yeah, you know, for, for us going forward, it's really just a matter of making sure that the base game is good and providing those mechanisms. Uh, the one specific thing for me is removing the hut. Like, uh, if I can get that completely gone so that the player is totally immersed, uh, then I feel that sets it up better for players to tell their own stories and then they can record it immersed. Sort of along those lines, again, to continue that, I'm wondering how you guys seeing, uh, do you see, I mean, do you see photorealism as an asset in, in telling more compelling, emotionally engaging stories, or is it maybe an obstacle or a burden or somewhere in between? I think it's, a, it's an artistic choice. I think you can tell uh, great stories with photorealism. I take it, think it takes a huge team to do that. Mm. Uh, but uh, to me, some of my most uh, like intense emotional uh, reactions haven't been from photorealistic games. Again, I think that comes back to so long as the game is translated from being the game to being in the player's head. Like, we were playing Minecraft with some of my friends over the weekend, and we set up this really ridiculous survival situation where uh, um, it was a whole big ice world that I'd made, and uh, there was only um, one like uh, uh, one like tiny little area that spawned animals, and so we had to go out and try and survive. And we're getting like really emotional and intense and yelling at each other about it. And and uh, and so I think that's a situation where the art style wasn't the game. The game wasn't even the game. It was the game we created in our heads, and that was where the emotion was. It wasn't like some mechanic or this or that. It was the fact that we had translated the game from being on the screen to being being in, in us, and then screaming at each other. <laughs> All right, so we sort of touched on this when Greg was talking about the notion of, you know, the superhero experience, um, just the power fantasy that we see in a lot of games, the desire to be epic. Um, what's an area of the human experience that you feel like games aren't addressing or addressing well right now? Well, like... Other than sex. <laughs> yeah. I think... Uh, it's you know it's it's just about everything besides the the power fantasy thing. Um, the the power fantasy thing you know much like with the goes hand in hand with the excitement thing is something that games have have got pretty much well nailed. And then the the more the more personal more subtle experiences are, are uh, less common um, games that um, and yeah some of these you know emotionally extremely powerful games have been games that have like made you feel very vulnerable. You know everything from Daisy to like Amnesia and and so forth, and um, it's, it's hard and scary to, you know, design games like that, I suppose, because you're, you, you know, it's a real leap of faith um, on the designer's part, uh, believing that the player's going to want to put themselves in a situation where they can, you know, feel vulnerable and feel limited in, in, in some way. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think those, those types of emotions that are more relatable to our everyday life are the ones that are less common in games. Um, uh, of course, many of us play games in order to get away from those day-to-day -day emotions, I think, uh, but at the same time, uh, there, there's, some, there's some interesting middle ground there where a game doesn't have to like, remind us that like, gas prices are going up and there's an election or something like that, but they could still like, resonate with us um, on, on an emotional level that we can relate to. Um, and I think that, you know, that just requires um, a certain amount of, if, if nothing else, just kind of subtlety that and subtlety is not necessarily the strongest suit of games in general. Yeah, I think that loss, for me, I think that's the big one, loss. Um, anger and frustration you can do through a variety <laughs> of creative mechanisms, but loss is, a, loss is a tough one because not only have you got to get the player attached to whatever it is you're taking away, um, but you've also got to get them to feel loss um, as part of that. And so. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's the challenging one, and I don't think that Daisy's really nailed that yet. Maybe it has for some people, but that will be the one I set my backpack down once and could never pick it up again, and I felt lost. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> so, kudos. Yeah, the, the backpack eating, definitely. <laughs> there, there are games like, you know, stuff like EverQuest. You could, like, play it for 600 hours and, you know, die in the plane of hate somewhere, and, like, you can't get your corpse back, and there's... 600 hours worth of your investment, all, the, all your armor and stuff like that, just gone. And this is back in like 1999, but that game made people feel lost. You know? Yeah, I mean, and honestly, like in seriousness um, though, like one time, like, I mean, I found a bike in your game 
and I love that bike, and it was, <laughs> it was like, and I don't, I mean this completely sincerely, it changed, fundamentally changed my gameplay experience, and then I lost it, um, and uh, that did, like, it did completely give me an emotional arc through playing the game, so like, you guys are getting there, like, I'm like don't worry, <laughs> like, it's like, not just me being like a snarky, like, I almost said three words I would not want to say in front of a bunch of people, wow, um, me being snarky. Uh, I think that stuff is in there because of the systems, and I really like that about that game. I loved that bike. That was really poignant. And to, uh, <laughs> sorry, the thank bicycle. you all for joining our panel today. I know uh, you came a long way to do so, and some of us, it wasn't a very easy journey. Uh, you got, uh, Dean got hass hassled at customs over Daisy for, uh, <clears throat> for some bugs or something like that. You, yeah, know, you <laughs> never know when they're, they're going to come at you, but not at customs. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today. God, that feels good. Uh, um, my name is Logan Decker, and uh, look in your little goodie bags. If you have a green, uh, excuse me, if you have a red sticker, come on up. I want to give you a Dead Island to, um, excuse me, a Dead Island iPad cover. And if you have a green sticker, oh my gosh, you've got a MechWarrior Legendary Founders Pack. So come on up, come say hi. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a fantastic show. Again, thanks to all the panelists for joining us.